so we'll get going and then if anyone else joins they can um they can join us along the way so um welcome to media asks everybody um it is jointly organized by the young consultants at the Amelia and the Amelia team um, offering support. Um, a little bit about the Amelia. Um, formerly, um, several different services in Tunbridge Wells, um, consisting of uh, the museum, library, art gallery, gateway, which is frontline council service, forest information and the Kent Adult Education. These services will all come together um, in the Amelia and um, will be a new exciting cultural and learning space um, bringing together books, objects, documents, photographs and visual art um, housed in a vibrant and revitalised building which is currently um, going undergoing a beautiful renovation. Um, which is that one. So this is what it will be um, the building in the front um, already ex in existence but being added to the education building in the background um, and the Amelia will comprise as I say several different services um, part of this we have a um, whole list of activities that we've um, pledged that we're going to do um, part of that is Amelia asks um, today's talk is with Emily Still editor of Elephant Art Magazine. We have two more talks coming up, one on the 18th and one on the 27th. And that's with Kim Drummond, a class assistant educator, and one with Matt White. So that's coming up. Um, always good to say thank you to our uh, sponsors and uh, funders. So that's Arts Council England, Heritage Office, Kent County Council and Tumbridge Wells Borough Council. Um, we are very pleased and proud to receive these fundings and we're uh, busy working on lots of different things as part of our um, Heritage Offery funding as well as Arts Council. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Bethany who is our young consultant who has negotiated with um, Emily and she has invited her along today. So uh, Bethany, over to you. Hello, as Ed said, I'm Bethany and I'm going to be doing the in conversation part of this event. And I'm really excited to introduce Emily Steer, who is the editor of Elephant Magazine and is now going to do a short presentation. Thank you. Um, so I thought it would be good just to talk through kind of the timeline um, that's got me to this point. I think one of the big things to highlight is just how random some of the things that happen are like how some opportunities come up and then change your course a bit and I think that's something that's very consistent across a lot of journalists as I know that they haven't necessarily taken the kind of traditional route in um, that is possible and I will talk about that as well but yeah definitely my experience has been taking opportunities as I've seen them and kind of working in that way so Elephant Magazine is a quarterly print publication uh, which comes out four times per year. It's been going for just over 10 years and I joined five years ago. At that point, the website was kind of just being developed and I guess one of the big challenges and one of the big changes over the last few years has been how to bring that into the digital world while still holding on to what the magazine is and has been. And yeah, I guess kind of figuring out how that voice and that tone kind of comes alive for a digital audience, how that all gets packaged. Um, our tagline is life through art, and we like to explore kind of wider social, cultural and pol political topics through art. Again, that's something that's developed more and more since I started and which our current team have really, really pushed. Um, so we never really want things to be too art jargony or sort of exclusive for people who've maybe had a certain education within the art world really want people who like engaging with wider topics to come on and feel inspired by the work that we're showing um so i wanted to start actually with my a levels um, i wasn't sure if i wanted to do english or art at uni and i think again this is kind of a big 
thing within the team. We have people who've come from more of an English background and people who've come from more of a creative background. So I did um, history, philosophy and English lit in case I wanted to go on and do an English degree. And then I also did art and drama in case I wanted to do an art degree. Um, by the time I finished my A-levels, I felt like I really wanted to go to art college. I wanted to see what it was all about. And obviously with art, you can do a foundation year. So I felt like doing that one year, I could then go on still and do either one. So I went to St. Martin's, um, which was very creative. And you got to kind of try out each different type of um, speciality. So you kind of would go through a week of fashion, a week of art, all different things. And I felt like I really wanted to go towards art. So I went to Camberwell and I did a three year drawing degree. I think English was always something that I kind of held on to. It was something that I felt torn about not doing. And the thing that I really engaged with on the art degree was the writing side of it. We had a really amazing theory tutor. And I felt like while I loved making work, I didn't particularly like doing drawings and paintings for that kind of wider context and to have pricks and to kind of work on being a practicing artist. The thing that I enjoyed was just like the process of doing it. So I felt like going into a career as an artist probably wasn't the right thing for me. So really started engaging with the theory classes and started to kind of hunt out work experience that might help with that. And my first kind of move into journalism is that a friend of a friend, which often is how things work, which isn't necessarily always the best, um, because obviously it means that it relies on those relationships. But I think it is always worth putting feelers out there. This was just something that I put out on Facebook and then it got kind of forwarded across to someone else who got in touch with me. So it's definitely worth making yourself available in that way um, to see yeah, if someone can help you out. So I wrote a couple of pieces for him. And then by the time I graduated, I started interning for him as well. So I was working part time at this platform, which was called Art Wednesday, um, which did articles about kind of fashion and art and wider culture. And then in my spare time, I was like, I'm going to work on becoming a journalist. I would say this is like the most freewheeling way to get into it, because even for experienced full time freelancers, it can be really difficult to get a kind of sustained regular income. But I really started out by pitching to loads and loads of different editors, um, cold calling people, just kind of putting all of the feelers out there that I could. I read a lot of advice online. I read a lot of articles, which I can actually share after with this in a list, which could be sent around. Um, but a lot of kind of pitching guidelines, advice on how to approach editors, which I found incredibly helpful. And I ended up writing for people like The Telegraph, another Grazia ID, Vice's Food Channel, um, it was incredibly fun. There's something really nice about working in that way and getting your idea picked up by a new editor. There's kind of an excitement with it, but it is also very up and down. Obviously, if one week you don't get something, then that's kind of something that you have to ride. And I think there is a level of being very thick skinned to do it in that way that's required because you are kind of facing a lot of people not replying to emails, people rejecting your pictures. So I think I really approached it in a way of if I send 10 pictures out today and one of them gets picked up, then that's great. And instead of just like sending one pitch and focusing really hard on that and then feeling kind of the rejection of it, I think it was much better to just like create this big system of um, getting in touch with a lot of people. And I think equally it's important to aim kind of high level and more niche as well, because obviously if you get into one of the really big newspapers or magazines early on, that's a really good thing for your career. But that's not always where you're going to build your voice as well. And you might have a couple of those which you then also mix in with more niche titles that kind of suit your interests. 
So I think it's really important at this stage and if you're get, getting into it in this way to do a lot of research, um, always look into like who is the editor that you're pitching to, look at the kind of subjects that they talk about on social media, look at the kind of articles that they write about because it it's really important that it feels tailored for them. Um, I've done this a lot in the past without realising and I get a lot of these now but pitches that aren't really tailored to you and what you're doing and obviously then it's much more difficult to get something commissioned so it's very good to research the actual person you're commissioning to and also to have a look at what section different magazines and newspapers have where your idea might fit and really really hone it so that you're kind of making their job a lot easier because you're giving them something that they can just pick up and run with instead of having to shape it with you um, I will say at this point, there is obviously a much more traditional route that some people go down, which would be to study English or journalism as an MA and then go for work experience or an internship in-house. Um, some of the challenges of this are that they're not that well paid. So if you're having to live in London and take on incredibly kind of difficult full time work, obviously that is a challenge for accessibility. Um, and obviously there's a limited amount out there, but that can be a good path to go down if that's possible. And then I think it's really good that you get a lot of knowledge about how teams work in house. You get to really see how all of those processes work. You get to see what happens when someone pitches, when the person on the receiving end gets it, how that gets formed. So I think a lot of those kind of skills that are really key to working in house are good to kind of pick up in those kind of jobs when you first graduate. Um, and I think the other important thing at that stage is developing your niche. So there are a lot of writers out there and there are a lot of writers who are pitching on the same subject. So I would say early on, working out what your interests are and if sticking to maybe two or three of them so that it feels like people know what to expect from you. Um, working out why you're the best person to write about those interests. So it might be something you've experienced in your life that you then want to make a part of your kind of repertoire. Um, it might be something that you've studied. Always figuring out what sets you apart from other journalists. So what unique angle can you bring to things? What tone of voice can you bring to things? And always when looking at niches, just does it limit you in any way? So is it so specific that like two people might want to publish something on it and that's it? So I think really kind of testing the edges of that early on are a really good thing to do and feeling conviction in what those interests are. You know, it's it's always going to be more exciting hearing from a writer who feels really passionate about what they're pitching rather than someone who's trying to kind of pick up on what the latest trend is. Um, so then after a couple of years of that, I applied for Elephant. So that was five years ago. I applied for the job of staff writer and in the interview, I actually ended up discussing some previous web experience I've, I'd had. So they changed the role to online editor for when I started, which I think, again, is always another really good thing to do. Even if you're interviewing for a job that has a certain description, if you feel like there's more that you can bring to it, it's always worth bringing that in and mentioning it because jobs are often flexible in that way. Um, and yeah, I found that this one was. So my job to begin with was very much about kind of forming and shaping the website as it was beginning, um, getting a lot of experience in print, interviewing a lot of artists, traveling, going to openings, meeting writers. Um, in general, journalism isn't that well paid, but I guess there are a lot of perks that come with the lifestyle as well, um, which is kind of going out and meeting people, press trips and those kind of things that kind of get you out in the world. And it also a really good opportunity to meet other people and for future job prospects as well. And it's another way that freelancers operate. Um, after two years, I was promoted to deputy editor. So then started to work more closely on print, which I've actually really, really enjoyed. I obviously started off in digital and I, I, I love how digital works. Like it's fascinating and it has changed so much even in the eight or nine years that I've been working. Um, but with print, then obviously you get incredibly involved with design, with the designers, with that process. Everything is quite select because you obviously have this kind of limited space to use. Um, but I would probably advise anyone going into it to get experience across print and digital because print is much harder to obviously get into and have a reliable job in. Um, so 
yeah, I would say as a job, it's incredibly rewarding. It's definitely a challenge. Um, there's always kind of more to cover. There's obviously a very, very fast speed that's required of that kind of work. And you kind of need to be like an endless stream of ideas um, because it is very quick turnaround. And I would also say, I guess, something that's ended up happening with my career, which is where I really wanted it to go. But I think something else to think about when you're getting into journalism is if you feel really passionate about being a writer and a journalist or if you want to get into editing. Because I think a lot of people see being the editor as just like the career, career progression of the writer. But obviously those jobs look incredibly different. Um, very little of my time now is spent writing. Most of it is spent commissioning, editing other people's work and also working on more kind of strategic and practical things behind the scenes as well. I would absolutely love that. That's kind of the role that I wanted. But I think if it feels like kind of writing is the way to go, then definitely kind of crafting more of that kind of voice, either as a columnist or as a journalist is yeah something that some people, obviously lots of people do for their whole careers. Um, so I would definitely kind of look on them as two different avenues rather than the natural end of, of being a journalist. I hope that that was helpful. I know I've given a lot of <laughs> information, um, but yeah, I guess if you have any questions at this point, maybe that'd be good. Uh, thanks, Emily. I know that was really useful for me in terms of thinking about roots into journalism. Um, if you have any questions as I'm talking, you can put them in the comments box. Um, but also, we'll have an opportunity for audience members to ask questions at the end. Uh, so I'm going to start with this sort of unavoidable question, which is, um, how, have your, how has your job changed since coronavirus? And have these been positive or negative impacts? Yeah. So I think, I mean, I guess we're lucky in a way in that we are in art journalism rather than, say, fashion. I've had friends who work for fashion magazines that have been much more affected just because of the way that that content gets created, where a lot of it is relying on kind of in-person shoots and stuff. So I think probably the main impact has actually just been the fact that we are a very kind of close-knit team who work very closely together, and a lot of our creativity kind of comes out of more spontaneous conversations in the office so I think that the remote working has probably been the biggest struggle in that way but in terms of how things work day to day it's actually been incredibly smooth um we've the the digital side of things I mean it's everyone kind of working behind their computers normally anyway so that's kind of carried on as it normally would um print I guess normally we would have a bit more in-person time where we can kind of look at the pages up on the wall and stuff so I think we've missed out on that a little bit but overall I would say I feel very lucky that the majority of things can kind of carry on working as they were. Um, a sort of related question is how do you perceive the journalism sort of industry changing in the long term in terms of it becoming increasingly digital and do you worry that there's going to be sort of a decline of things in print and yeah. yeah it's definitely something we talk about um obviously um so I think that I would say probably when I first got into journalism it actually looked more dire for print um for my type of magazine and I think that's where the difference is because for lots of newspapers and print publications where the, ex the experience isn't necessarily such a big thing. I think there's probably a bigger shift to digital. I would say with art and fashion publications, a lot of the people that read them are interested in kind of how things look and feel and in design and in kind of tactile objects. So I think that there is a level of kind of collectability and like luxury that's associated with print. I do think, though, it's incredibly important to have an equally strong digital platform now. So whereas five years ago, Elephant was just a print magazine, it's like we've seen a huge change in having that digital presence because obviously you can reach so many more people. Um, 
people can engage with you in a slightly lighter way to begin with rather than having to like buy a whole magazine as a way of engaging um so yeah definitely we've seen that shift but i think we feel very confident that we can carry on with kind of both elements and i suppose over the years they've actually become more separate as well which i think is a good thing because they're both more rounded for their own thing so i think rather than seeing it that like print becomes digital is almost how can we make the most of those two very different things that we get from those two platforms yeah okay great uh, so my next question is um what are you most proud of about elephant and what are your thoughts for the future looking at digital versus print again and how that's going to change yeah i guess i mean for me it's just been so exciting being on involved with something that's grown so much i think you know being part of like a, a massive and well established institution like a newspaper or something i think as the individual you have less power to change or evolve what's happening and i think because we are a very small team like in the time that i've been there i've seen it change so much and that feels very exciting to kind of yeah i guess watch that evolution and know that you've been a really big part in it I would say, I mean, I feel really proud of our 10th anniversary issue. I was really excited about that. It was self-care themed um, and it just, everything came together in such a wonderful way. Um, and we were all very excited about that. And I think also just the way that Elephant has embraced more kind of social and cultural topics rather than being so inward facing. I've, I've been very proud of that and that has been a job of the entire team really kind of pushing it in that direction and trying to I guess take the stories that aren't necessarily the kind of main art world stories but to look at people who are slightly more underrepresented um, and also something which our deputy editor had worked incredibly hard on is kind of getting voices that aren't normally covered at all in the art world into it so like talking to people who make artworks behind the scenes for other artists and things so I think I just feel really proud to be one of the publications that's really kind of championing the broader scale of what the art world is rather than just the top end of it. Yeah that was going to be one of my next questions actually. <laughs> um, so looking at how you explore sort of the social and political implications of art, do you think that art should be used more by more mainstream newspapers to report on current events? Yeah, I think, I do think that it's always underestimated as a section. Um, culture, when there are redundancies, that's the section that tends to be the first to go. And I think like everyone likes art, <laughs> you know, I think, I think there's kind of a misunderstanding that to engage with it, you have to have learned it. And I think a lot of that is to do with the very dense language that's used around it by lots of like galleries publications like there is this huge thing around kind of very academic language and I think if it was made more accessible by the media and by art publications then it would kind of broaden out what people can get from it and yeah I think you could get so much from art especially when you look at big topics through art that you might not be able to get from kind of straight up reporting. How do you navigate the sort of intersection between the art side of an article and the writing side of it and how the balance works? Um, I guess it's probably, I mean, I guess the first place we'd look at that is, is how it's pitched. Um, so we probably look much more for the theme to be pitched rather than the artist or the artwork. It's like if someone wants to interview an artist, we want to know why, we want to know what the conversation topics will be and you want a rough idea of what the headline might be. like you know, what's this one thing that you're pulling from that interview, which is very different to how we used to approach it, where it was just like, yeah, we love this artist, just kind of go and chat to them. So we need to know what that hook is and what that angle is straight up. Um, and I guess because we all come from, you know, some of, some of the team come from an English lit background, some come from graphic design and stuff. So I think we probably have quite a good ear just towards what sounds too much like art speak as well because not many of us have come from the kind of art theory background. Yeah, how does that strategy and the sort of way you approach um, the magazine differ to 
uh, say, like newspaper journalism? What's the like big differences between them? Um, I, I think, I mean, in terms of like news reportage, I think we have a lot more time to consider things, which is good and bad, obviously. With newspapers, there is that kind of immediate, just get something out as soon as something happens, which then I think makes it more of a straight up report rather than kind of a, an opinion or a consideration around what's happened. Um, so, yeah, I would say even if something is like very timely for us, we will still want to bring an angle to it. So that's whether it's from the writer or from the artist that's featured, it's is kind of... I guess it's okay for it to be subjective, whereas with newspaper reporting, it needs to be much more kind of, well, we all know that it's not that (laughs) that neutral, um, but at least it needs to feel a bit more neutral, I would say. Yeah. Um, What magazines sort of inspire the work you do at Elephant? And are there any particular journalists that do, do something that you really draw from? Um, so I really enjoy the Gourmand. I absolutely love what they do. And I think, I guess there are kind of crossovers because even though they focus a lot on food, they kind of have a crossover into art and food is often explored through other other avenues, you know, and I think that's what I really enjoy with magazines and with journalism when it's it's kind of using one thing to talk about another or it's kind of crossing through different medias. I think that that feels much more eye-opening and I think then you get, a more more varied opinions on it because it's not just like art journalists talking about art you know it's kind of mixing lots of things um in terms of journalists I actually love our own um Charlotte Jefferson <laughs> she is one of our um, editors at large she's been at the magazine for an incredibly long time and I just find it so inspiring the way that she brings her own she brings her own experience into it a lot And she uses that to explore much wider subjects. And I've just always admired kind of how bold she is with her writing. And yeah, it's it's like, it's funny, it's personable. It just completely draws you in. And I think that's what I look for in in writing, definitely. Yeah. Um, So how do you, do you, I know you talked about um, taking on more of an editorial role rather than, uh, a uh, writing role but do you used sort to of miss doing that writing side of it or would you do you w- wish you could do more of it yeah it's, it's interesting I would say since I have slowed down on the writing when I do write something I enjoy it a lot more um I think especially when you're in-house because you're you're always writing in the same style it can start to feel a bit like you're a machine (laughs) um and I know a lot of people at kind of publications where it's very much just like churning it out and I think you know you find yourself using the same phrases again and again you find yourself going to sort of it, it feels too automatic and I think now when I sit down to write there's something that feels really new again which I really enjoy um but I do think there's probably I think when you're in an editorial position it can end up feeling like it's a luxury to write so I think I always feel a bit guilty if I'm writing something because I feel like there's more like practical things I could be doing so I think that's probably the biggest um yeah like discomfort that was there for me with it because I feel like oh this is like writing this is really fun I should do this in my own time um whereas obviously it's part of the job as well so yeah I think yeah, I guess there's kind of good and bads to it because, yeah, it's, it gives you a chance to kind of look at it afresh if you're not doing it so much. Yeah, so I edit and write for my school newspaper and I really find that, like, when I read other people's articles, I then, like, take on bits of their writing style and, like, uh, get inspired by what they've created. And then I, when I write an article, I find myself using sort of similar things uh do you find that I think it's I think that's something I really like with editing because you are reading other people's work all the time and I think that it could definitely be inspiring in terms of yeah if someone writes really differently to you it's like oh wow this is quite exciting this is something that I might want to try out um and yeah I think that it's 
I, I guess I feel like when you're writing all the time, you're kind of in your own bubble and it's it's harder than to absorb other things. And I think through editing, it's obviously a different process just to reading because you're so in it. It's, it's almost like it kind of becomes your own writing as well, obviously, because you're working so closely with it. So I think that that is a really good practice for writing, definitely. As long as it's not just like, right, I'll take this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another question I had was about uh, sort of the notorious long hours of journalism and whether you struggle to maintain that sort of work life balance. Yeah, I would say probably the most difficult for me has been when there's been um, lots of travel, like it is quite art world specific, but you do end up going on lots of press trips and art fairs and stuff. And I think when I was doing that very heavily, like there was a point where I was going away at least once a month. And I guess your social life starts blending with your work life. And that did feel very intense. But I don't know, I, I guess it really depends what kind of thing you work on because there's some people who will end up working on like the night desks or newspapers and stuff where it's incredibly intrusive in your life um and often I suppose kind of when you're starting out is when you have to keep the hours that are least suitable for you as well because it's you might just want to take an opportunity um but I think I like what I do so much that it sort of it just feels quite exciting um I've definitely felt burnt out at times but I think that yeah have having it like it feels like such a fortunate amazing job to be able to do so I think a lot of the time it's kind of stuff that I do really want to be doing um but yeah I would say definitely early on that's when you might end up with with some hours that you don't like and those. to what extent do you get like motivated by the people around you and like working together as a team to produce something and is that true when you've got like a larger team in a less small sort of magazine yeah so in our team we have eight eight people seven or eight people um who to an extent some are part-time some are full-time and it's, de it's definitely exciting like the more that we've grown because I suppose you get different viewpoints coming in you get different ages on the team so again that kind of broadens your outlook um and I think that was a big thing when I was freelance that I didn't enjoy because I was just sitting on my own at home behind the computer. Um, so you're kind of having ideas and like firing them off to people, but you don't necessarily get to have that conversation. And I think that's where it's really important if you are freelance to kind of make connections with other freelancers, start conversations on social media and just create that network for yourself because it can be really difficult to keep inspired and keep motivated if you are kind of working in in a bit of a bubble and I would say that's as much for creative ideas as it is just to be able to discuss like the stresses of the job ask other people what their experiences are give each other support um you know a lot of the information that I've that I guess I found out about pitching and just about how everything works did come from other people as well and I think that that is a really important thing to have yeah um what what would you say is the biggest challenge you faced in your career or like big rejection that really hit your confidence um oh I'm trying to think it would definitely be something early on <laughs> um I think probably the most difficult thing is that often people just don't reply to you if you pitch and they don't like it and I think now that I'm on the commissioning side of things I can see like there are so many pitches that come in from writers that it, it just wouldn't be possible to kind of reply to all of them so often we will just reply if something gets picked up but I would say when I started I've really felt like the editor has sat here and read it and they hate it so much that they're not even replying to me and I think that that was it was very difficult to just like keep on going and keep firing them out and sort of not take that personally and I think it, it is only being on the other side I'm like oh okay actually like that really didn't mean as much as I thought it did at the time so I think that is a big challenge and I know a lot of people who've had very successful happy careers in-house and then have felt really nervous to pitch afterwards and even people in in-house positions who want to write for other publications but are nervous to pitch 
So I think, yeah, but kind of building up a thick skin to that and realizing like it's not necessarily about me it's also just this might not be the right idea at the right time and kind of separating that out yeah was definitely a big challenge yeah on the sort of other hand of the biggest challenge what's been the most valuable job work experience volunteering position article you've done in terms of um yeah yeah I would say like some of the early things at Elephant I think starting to meet artists who I like never thought I'd be in the same room with and then interviewing them and kind of being treated as an equal felt quite crazy um and I think that interviews are incredibly rewarding because you know you're meeting people who are in your field who who you know whose work you might be fascinated by and yeah that there there is just such a special feeling that comes with that if obviously in the art world it means going to like an artist studio and kind of seeing behind the scenes and everything um I think one of I and I guess also then when you almost make a connection that's kind of beyond the interview because sometimes you have an interview and it's great and it's like you kind of get them to say everything that you wanted them to say um but I think then when it feels like there is a really nice personal connection um so there's an artist called Fabien Verdier that I went to visit in the south in France and she's got this amazing kind of rural house and studio near Paris and they cooked us this like amazing lunch and I talked to her all afternoon about art and what inspires her and like architecture and it that was like this could be every day of my job and I would be so happy like that was amazing um and then in terms of I guess things that I've written I think I wrote something about depression really early on with quite a personal piece um when I started and I was so proud of that and it got shared by like doctors and stuff which felt really good and I would say because I was quite early on I wasn't used to writing personal pieces I actually kind of avoided sharing it too much when it came out which I do regret now um but definitely writing something that kind of came from myself and seeing comments from people saying that it had helped them was really rewarding for me. Yeah. Um, so assuming you can't do interviews every day, what is your yeah. favorite sort of everyday task in your job? Yeah, so I would say, I mean, right now, a lot of it is editing pieces because we're working on the next issue of the magazine. So right now, like 80% of the day is going through pieces that have come in editing them, um, fact-checking them, then sending them to another editor to go through and then having back and forth with the designers who are starting to lay pieces out. So they will send me layouts, then we go through feedback and then I do captions. So I'm very involved in kind of every stage of that, which I guess is different when you get to bigger publications because you might have a commissioning editor, a managing editor and an editor-in-chief who kind of all do part of that. So I do very much go from like just the practical, making sure that everything's kind of on the page where it should be right through to commissioning things. Um, I mean, really boring things like budgeting and stuff. Um, there's quite a lot of kind of practical things that way. There's always an element with my work of looking at what's next because we are developing as a company at the moment. So in between issues, I tend to be looking at strategy and kind of planning out what the next bit of time is going to look like. And then I also do some digital as well, but that's generally Louise Benson, who's our deputy editor, who manages all of that. Yeah, um, that was gonna be my next question actually about sort of the print cycle of the magazine and yeah. it's difficult yeah. that your work kind of fluctuates and you don't have the same thing all the time, or do you like the variation? I quite like it because I think with digital it's like so relentless because <laughs> it's just kind of the same amount every day and digital's rewarding in its own way because you obviously get to see a much more immediate like feedback loop um, as soon as something goes out you'll see if it's being shared you'll see how well it's being read so I think there's something exciting about that but I definitely enjoy that there is this variety where every three months I guess at the start of the cycle we'll all meet and we're discussing ideas then I will have about a month of commissioning, getting articles in. Then you kind of go into all of the layouts and everything and then finally proofing. And for me, yeah, I definitely enjoy that kind of change in energy, although it's always stressful when it gets to the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my last question is, yep. um, 
what qualities make you well suited to your job? Um, I think I'm very cool headed. I don't freak out easily about things, um, at least not externally. <laughs> um, so I think just in terms of kind of being part of a team and sort of allowing all of those parts to work, I think that that is definitely one of my stronger points. Um, I guess the combination of kind of creativity and well writing's creativity as well but like artistic creativity and writing I think is actually really helpful and I think it helps me when interviewing artists as well because I'm kind of coming from the point of a journalist and also someone who used to make work so I feel like that is a very good thing um I I think I enjoy pressure like I feel kind of at a loose end if I'm not jam-packed with work so I do I've, I've spoken to people who do and don't like this before and I think most people who enjoy journalism actually really enjoy working under pressure um because you kind of have that fuel to like keep going and keep pushing so I think that that is probably the main thing and that is something to watch as well because obviously it means that you can get burnt out um but I do think it makes me very suitable for the job So I, th I think Bethany may have frozen there. Oh, I wasn't sure if it was me or her. I think so. Um, but that was really interesting uh, question thank and answer. Um, so, th yeah, thank you for your time and generosity. Um, I wonder if there's any questions in the sidebar. Oh, there's Bethany back. Uh, yeah, sorry, I think my <laughs> Wi-Fi just cut out. Um, so, yeah, I th thanks so much, Emily. That was really... Great. Um, so there's a question in the comment box, which is, um, what would be your top tip for young people wanting to get into cultural journalism? Um, is volunteering or an internship needed? I think that it can definitely help. Um, I, I, I think so much of it is around making contacts and that can be done through an internship or through volunteering, definitely. It can also be done through social media as well. I think kind of following journalists that you admire, um, commenting on their tweets, making sure that you're kind of making yourself part of the circle that you want to get into is really important early on. Um, obviously cold pitching, which I discussed earlier, and just kind of sending your own ideas to other people directly, um, to editors can be really helpful. Um, yeah, I would, I think there's lots of avenues in, so I would say interning is a good one, but I am aware that there are massive access issues with that within the arts because most internships aren't paid. So I would say not to feel disheartened if that's not something that is available. Um, and that there, there definitely are other ways in. The main thing to just keep in mind is visibility. we might have had a, another little drop out okay cool. <laughs> um, but um that's yeah it's interesting about visibility um actually um because i've i had a little question about visibility um just to say do you think it's necessary to be in london or uh, southeast around london to progress in journalism cultural journalism or do you think there's other hubs maybe yeah i mean i think Oh, my voice just bounced back at me. Um, I think there is definitely a problem with it being too London centric. Um, yeah, um, a massive problem with it, which needs to change. But that's not to say that there aren't opportunities outside of London. And definitely, you know, when we go on visits to uh, galleries like Baltic in um, Gateshead, you will have regional journalists as well who are there who maybe work for like the BBC, The Guardian as a kind of specialist in the area. So I, I do think that there is work, especially the fact that it's digital. Well, it's so digital because there are plenty of ideas that don't actually rely on your location. So to be a freelancer, I think, you know, you can definitely kind of have a career outside of London. Um, but there is obviously the issue with the fact that lots of head offices are in London and I mean culture as a whole is so centred in London and obviously lots of the funding is centred there. I think what will be interesting with this period is that so many people are working remotely anyway so with head offices being less of a thing 
that could potentially change because people are getting more used to working with people remotely. Um, so where I think before there was a block on being able to work somewhere if you couldn't physically be there, I do think that that will change a lot. Um, so yeah, I think, again, just trying to make yourself visible in the digital realm mm. is enough um, without having to like physically be placed somewhere. Absolutely, thank you. I don't know if there's any other questions. We'll leave it in case anyone in the chat would like to add. Oh yeah, we've got a very a question there. Bethany, if you'd like to. Uh, yeah, so it sounds very useful to have the writing that we have with experience in art, design and English. Do you think it's important to have skills and experience in all the different elements that um, when working on a magazine or is it better to focus on one key skill more specific to your area of work? Yeah, so I would say that I mean, lots of skills obviously are learned on the job as well. I think obviously some people do journalism degrees so that they can kind of just have that complete baseline education. But I do know a lot of people who've got into it through an interest in writing or through an interest in art and who have then learned the kind of proofreading, copy editing and those kind of things um, aside from that. And I, I think it's kind of, yeah, feeling like you need to like learn all of those things before you start work can be quite overwhelming. Um, so I think definitely having some strong areas and, you know, even taking short courses, like I did a course in um, proofreading about a year into Elephant to kind of back up everything that I was doing. So I think that there is also the opportunity kind of once you're in a, a role or once you're kind of seeing the type of role you want to go for to see if there's like skills that you need to brush up on but yeah I think people come from all different kinds of backgrounds um and yeah I think kind of developing some of those things as you go is quite natural as well excellent I I wonder if if there's any more questions, speak now or for Heather, hold your slides. Um, no, I think that might be it. So um, to both Bethany and Emily, thank you very much for a really interesting, informative, uh, varied talk. It was really great to hear you chatting away. It was, yeah, really natural and interesting. And I think for me, it sort of um, demystified a lot of things. So it was, I hope other people really enjoyed it as well. Um, and thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you. very much for coming, everyone else. And um, a little plug for the, the next two talks. Um, we will be doing one next week. Where's my desktop? So we've got, um, that was today. On the 18th, we've got Kim Drummond. And on Thursday, 27th, we've got Matt White, uh, who's an architect at Matt Architects. Uh, architecture firm so um, and again with a different uh, young consultant asking um, the questions so we hope you can join us then same same sort of thing if you want to um, join us sign up for tickets on the amelia.co.uk website um, and hopefully we'll we'll see you there thank you Emily and Bethany thank you thanks see you bye